just before I start this morning, just a shout out to Danny, and it's his 50th anniversary to Alex. Alex, I know you'll be watching uh, this video sometime, so just want to um, congratulate you guys on uh, 50 years of marriage, and uh, we, uh, today, yeah, yesterday, yesterday, so uh, that's fantastic. I was saying to Danny before that, uh, you know, it's his 50th anniversary and Alex's, so if you add them together, it's 100, and you should get a letter from the Queen, um, but I know you'll get a letter from the King saying, well done, good and faithful servant, so God bless you, what a legacy, and... Um, um, congratulations to you, Alex, too. I know you'll be watching. Praise God. Well, we've been um, doing a series called The Golden Thread of Grace, and uh, we have been doing uh, a couple of other things along the way, but uh, in this part of The Golden Thread of Grace, we've been going through Psalms. So as we've been looking at Jesus through the Old Testament, in each book of the Old Testament, uh, we've been going through the book of Psalms, and uh, we broke that into seven parts. And um, as we're looking at Jesus through the book of Psalms. So we've looked at him as the shepherd king, the creator king, the suffering king, the saviour king, the righteous king. And last time we looked at the reigning king, we looked at his uh, second coming and the millennial reign. And, uh, you know, when it comes to the second coming of Jesus, there were 300 prophecies in his first coming, and all of them actually were fulfilled in the word of God. And now for the second coming, there are over 500 prophecies and all of those we will be fulfilled. And, you know, David throughout the Psalms frequently describes a king who is coming to rule and reign in righteousness. And uh, we looked at Revelation 20 and verse 6, which says, Blessed and holy is he who has set sorry, who has part in the first resurrection, over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and reign with him for a thousand years. And then we looked in the book of Zechariah and uh, in chapter 14 where it talks about that one day Jesus will come and stand on the Mount of Olives and it will actually split in two. And uh, we know that uh, the land, Jerusalem, is waiting for that. There's a fault line, and um, when you talk to people in Jerusalem, it's not a matter of if, it's when. And we know when, because the Bible says in Zechariah that he will come uh, with his saints, and his feet will touch the mountain, and it will split in two. So we're looking forward to that day. Amen. So we looked at, last time was the reigning king. Today we're going to look at the mighty and anointed king, Jesus the Messiah. And you know, the word Messiah in Hebrews means anointed or anointed one. And uh, anointed in the New Testament is the word Christ. So Christ in Greek means anointed. And, uh, you know, I love um, numbers and names and uh, how the Holy Spirit works that within Scripture. You know, the word Christ is, uh, appears 559 times in the King James Version. So five grace... Um, so grace, grace, and the number nine is the, the number for fullness. So grace, grace, fullness. And uh, in John 1.16 it says, And of his fullness we have received grace for grace. And so in the Hebrew they always they go backwards, fullness, grace, grace. And that's what um, John 1.16 says, Of his fullness we have received grace for grace. Nine, five, five, or five, five, nine. Looking at it forward. Isn't that amazing? I love that's just no coincidence how that happened. So, so we're going to look in the book of um, Psalms today as we look at Jesus, the um, anointed uh, king and mighty king. Psalm 45. Let's go to Psalm 45 this morning if you've got your Bibles. And we're starting in verse 1. And you'll see this whole um, subject come up of Jesus, the mighty king and the anointed king. So it says, My heart is overflowing with a good thing. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty. And in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, 
and righteousness. And your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. O oh, your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Your love, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. So there's David the king talking about his king, talking about the mighty anointed king, which is Jesus, because he says, because of truth, humility, and righteousness. That's what Jesus came to this earth, in truth, humility, and righteousness. It says in verse 3, he's the mighty one. In verse 7, God has anointed you. So in verse 2, it said, You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. And, you know, the first time that it's recorded that Jesus actually spoke in the synagogue after he uh, was baptized in water and then the Holy Spirit came upon him. And if you come with me to Luke chapter 4, and um, Luke chapter 4, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon him, he goes into the wilderness, and then the Bible says that he came in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we see that in um, verse 14 of chapter 4. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out throughout all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and was his custom. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it is written. Um, in verse 18, and he's quoting out of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. The first time Jesus really steps up and speaks in a synagogue, he's saying this, he has been anointed or anointed by God. And anointed to do what? To preach the gospel to the poor. Uh, he's been sent to... Heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book. And if you, if you have a look at Isaiah 61, 1 to 2, he closed the book in the middle of a sentence because that goes on to say, and the vengeance, the day of vengeance of our God. But he closed the book and didn't talk about that because now is the acceptable year of the Lord. Now is the dispensation of grace. The day of vengeance of our God is not here yet. And he closed the book and sat down and um, all the eyes of um, all those who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now I want to read to you verse 22, but before I do that I want to read again. In verse 2 of Psalm 54 it says, Grace is poured on your lips. Look at what it says here in verse 22 of Luke 4. So all bore witness to him and marveled at his gracious words, which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not the son, Joseph's son? So Jesus' words were gracious. They actually heard him um, speak and they saw these gracious words that, um, that David talked about in Psalms. And then, of course, in verse 7 of um, Psalm 45, it says, God has anointed you. So Jesus was anointed by God. So what is it to be anointed? Well, yeah, in the Bible, it means to be set apart. You know, in um, Ezekiel, we see there are people and food and cherubs that were set apart for God. In uh, Leviticus, we see the altar and the tabernacle set apart. And then we see there are prophets and kings that are set apart unto God. And God anoints, even though sometimes he uses men to do it, such as Samuel anointing David. Now, like the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts, it was received through men through the laying out of hands, but Jesus is the baptizer. And, you know, if ever I pray for someone, or when I do pray for someone for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, I might be laying hands on them, but it's actually Jesus that's the baptizer, because Jesus, John the Baptist said, uh, that he will baptise you with the Spirit and fire. So it's actually Jesus that's doing the baptising. Very similar, men may um, lay their hands on for anointing, but it's God that does actually the anointing. Um, let me show you that in 1 Samuel 16, 13, uh, when Samuel anointed King David. 
It says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So there it is, Samuel anointing David. But look at this passage in 2 Samuel, chapter 12, verse 7. Then Nathan said to David, You are a man, and thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. So God anointed him. Even though Samuel was the one who actually um, anointed with oil, it was God um, who actually anointed David. And you can see that in those two passages. So really, when it comes to ministry, men do the appointing, but God does the anointing. And God anointed Jesus. He set him apart for a purpose. In Acts 10.38, it, it, it says in this passage how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went out doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Amen. And so, um, and then we read before that he actually said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. So, you know, God anointed Jesus, um, people get anointed, you are anointed. God has anointed you and set you apart for a purpose. In 2 Corinthians 1, 21 to 22, it says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also sealed us and has given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So, you know, not only are you anointed by God, but he has actually marked you, he's put a seal upon you, and when he gave you the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. And, you know, when people talk about, you know, worried about taking the mark of the beast and um, all that sort of thing, you know, the wonderful thing, you are already marked. You already have a seal, and that is the seal of the Holy Spirit. You've been marked, and God knows that, the devil knows that as well. And uh, you don't have to worry about that because you've already received your mark and that's the Holy Spirit. Amen. But let's look at um, the Gospel of um, John where Jesus actually anointed somebody who set them apart. And um, I, I particularly love this story. Um, to me, it's, it's actually quite humorous. Um, just as I was saying the other week how, you know, the, the, uh, one of the scriptures I love in Exodus, how God actually picked the wheels of the chariots of the um, Israel of the Egyptians, so they drove their chariots with difficulty. Um, you're going to find parts of this actual passage quite humorous. So uh, let's start in verse uh, one of chapter nine in uh, John. So as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciple asked, his disciple asked him, saying, "Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind?" Now that's a funny question, because here's the disciples saying, this man is blind, somebody must have done something wrong. Was it the, the man? He was born blind. That's mean, if he actually sinned, he would have sinned in his mother's womb or sinned as a fetus. And so they didn't really think about what they were actually saying. But you know, we still see that today, where if something's wrong with somebody, um, you know, say they're sick or you know, they've been had to carry something, you know, it's amazing how people say, well, what, what have you done wrong? Or, you know, what secret sin? Or, what have, you know, it's got to be you. Um, because, you know, Jesus heals, so if he's not healing you, there must be something wrong with you. And it just brings condemnation. And, um, you know, this, this passage is interesting because Jesus goes on to say this in verse 3. He says, neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Verse 4, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. So very interesting, Jesus saying, no one sinned that caused this man to be blind from birth. Definitely not him, because he didn't, you know, he, he didn't sin before he came into this world and caused that blindness to happen. And so Jesus said, no, it wasn't that. He said, this actually... Um, he said, but the, that the works, he said, it wasn't the man, it wasn't the appearance, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. In other words, this man had to carry blindness um, all his life until he met Jesus. And then when he met Jesus, Jesus actually healed him. And then now his name is forever written in the Bible. And, um, and so 
It, this happened for the glory of God. Now, I don't believe God caused the blindness, but he allowed that man to carry the blindness so until the point where he, he met Jesus and he was healed. And that may mess with your theology. Sometimes we have to carry stuff so that they, at some stage God will be glorified. But look what happens because Jesus actually anoints him, which means he sets him apart. Because in verse 6 it says, when he said these things, he spat on the ground, made a clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And then he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. And so he went and washed and came back seen. Interesting. He anointed him. He set him apart. And then he actually sent him to a place, which means sent. So he anointed him to be sent out to do what? We're going to find out in a moment it was actually to be a witness because he now he actually starts to witness. So verse 8, the neighbours of those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is this not, uh, is this, uh, not he who sat and begged? And some said, this is he. And others said, he, he is like him. And he said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, washed, and I received sight. So he had a purpose for this man. He anointed him to actually be a witness. He anointed him to be an evangelist. He anointed him to be able to share his story about Jesus. And here's the interesting thing. All he, all he did, people knew this man. It was, they knew, knew him from birth, that he was blind, and then they meet him and he's actually been healed. And he can see. And they wanted to know why. They wanted to know what this was about. Why did that happen? And so he just told his story. He said, there was a man who came, asked me to do this, now I can see. And then they said, well, they said, how were your eyes opened? And they wanted to know. They wanted to know how this actually happened, and he was able to share it with them. And, you know, I believe that, especially in this coming year, and with everything that's going on, that, you know, that um, sharing your faith and uh, witnessing to people will just be so natural because things will happen in your life. Jesus will heal you. He'll help you through these situations. You'll be a shining light in this dark world, and people will see a difference, and they'll want to know why. They'll want to know who did this, and it'll be simple as sharing your faith with them. You know, when I was um, selling meat at the markets, and uh, I was away for three weeks because it was when our daughter had a brain aneurysm, and uh, we were overseas, and um, you know, helping her come through, and um, seeing God heal her, and with so many people praying, and when I got back, people said to me, "Oh, you've been away. We've missed you. You know, you haven't been around for three weeks. What have you been up to?" I said, "Well, I went to Houston, Texas," and they said, "Oh, wow. Tell us, um, you know, how was your how was your um, holiday?" I said, "Well, let you tell me about my holiday, and then I just share about our daughter and about how." Uh, she got the brain aneurysm, but the amazing part of that story is that when it actually happened, Jade actually uh, was on the ground and she actually had a vision of the feet of Jesus and the words brain aneurysm written in red and black. And so when they took her to the hospital, she knew exactly what had happened. You know, they could have said to her, look, just go home, you probably had some, you know, bad camp food or whatever, sleep it off, and she would have died. But she had that vision, and then she was able to tell the hospital, and then they rushed her uh, by helicopter to another hospital and worked on her. And not only, not only did she survive that, but there's actually no um, signs or symptoms that she actually ever had a brain aneurysm, which is an absolute miracle. And so I was just able to share that with people at the market who was asking me what I've done. And uh, as I was doing that, all of them said, oh, wow, I just felt my arm tingle. And so it was such an easy way because I was just telling my story. And I believe that, uh, you know, as we see God's provision and protection, you know, through this year and we shine that um, it's just going to be as simple as telling your story. It's not going to be like, oh, you have to evangelise. Or as evangelists would say, you know, if those people walking down the street, if you don't tell them about Jesus, they're going to hell, all that sort of stuff that we've had in the past. It's just going to be as simple as sharing the good news. 
you know, um, if I found a company tomorrow that actually would uh, can slash your power bill by 50%, I would tell everybody because that's good news. Well, we've got better news. We've got great news, and that's about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And we can just share that as we're just sharing our story. And so this is what happened with this man. He was anointed. He was set apart to just to share his story and to be a witness. And so, first of all, he witnessed to his neighbours because his neighbours, um, it says here that, um, just go back over the page, it says here that, therefore the neighbours who previously had seen the blind man said, is this not the same man? And they said, well, yes, it is. He looks like him, but he's, he was blind, but now he's actually can see. And then they, they asked him and he said, yeah, that's me. And they, and they said, well, how did this happen? How did your eyes open? He was able to share about Jesus. And then we go on to verse um, uh, 12, and they, and they said to him, well, where is he? And he said, I don't know. And they brought him, um, who formerly was blind, to the Pharisees. So now he's actually going to get an opportunity to speak to the Pharisees about this. Now, it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes, and the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, well, he put clay on my eyes and washed them, and I can see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. In other words, no, this can't mean, because he did this on a church day. You know, No one gets healed on a church day. You know, there was a, a man with a withered hand came into the synagogue one time. Jesus was there, and they were watching to see if Jesus would try to heal this man on the Sabbath. You know, how crazy is that? It's like... No one's getting healed in our church today. You know, like, that's crazy. And so here they're going, well, because he healed someone on the Sabbath, he mustn't be from God. It's like, that's just craziness. And then, and then he, others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? This is the Pharisees again. And there was division amongst them. But they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. And he said, well, he's a prophet. <laughs> and he goes on, he says... Um, but the Jews did not believe concerning him because they had been, that he'd been blind and received his sight until they called the parents. So here they are. It's evident, it's obvious that this man was blind. Now he can see. And so they're asking him the question. It doesn't fit in their theology. It's like, oh, no, that can't, this man can't be you know, from God who's done this because he's done it on the Sabbath and he's a sinner. But it's obvious this man is actually was... was um, blind and now he can see anyway so it, the man actually says he must be a prophet he understands that he's from god to be able to do such a thing but the jews wouldn't believe it you know i say sometimes you know don't i know what i believe don't confuse me with the truth you know they were getting confused with truth and um it was wasn't working with their belief system so they thought well let's let's call the parents in see what they have to say and so um Verse 18, the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? And they said, And how then does he see? And the parents said to them, Well, we know this, our son, that he was born blind. We know that. That's a fact. But by what means he now sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. But, but so they were, a little bit, they were a little bit scared of the Pharisees, just said, look, we can verify he was blind. We just really quite don't know how this happened. But then they said to him, um, uh, they said, he is of age, ask him, he'll speak for himself. In other words, what are you asking us for? You know, he's old enough to answer for himself. He'll tell you what happened, which he already had done. And then um, his parents said this because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore the parents said, he's of age, ask him. So they asked him again. They called the man who was blind and said to him, give glory to God, we know that this man's a sinner. And he answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. This one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. It, the, the evidence was in front of them what Jesus Christ had done. And so they said to him again, verse 26, what, what did he do to you and how did he open your eyes? 
And the man said, I told you already. They're asking the same question because they're not getting the answer they want. They're asking the same question. What did he do and, and uh, how did you become uh, able to see? And he, he said, I told you already and you didn't listen. And then he says, why do, you, why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciple also? He really turned it on them. They would have been furious because he was saying, well, you keep asking me this question. Maybe you want to become his disciple. Maybe you want to give your life to Jesus. Verse um, 28, then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he is from. And then the man answered and said, well, this is a marvellous thing, that you do not know where he's from, yet he's opened my eyes. In other words, you guys are supposed to be the custodians of the word of God, and here's a guy performing miracles, and you don't even know who he is. And verse 23, now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshipper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it's been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of, of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. <laughs> so this man was anointed, he was set apart. God anointed his eyes so that he could see and became a witness. He witnessed to his neighbours, he witnessed to the Pharisees, he witnessed to the Jews, and he was a witness even to his own parents. And he ended up speaking in boldness, and he actually um, was speaking grace, because he said, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Paul says that. He says, in our flesh, no, we can do nothing, dwells no good thing. Anything we do comes from God. So when it was determined what he would be doing before he was born, it, it was determined what he would be doing before he was born. In other words, he was, it was determined that he would one day be an amazing witness for Jesus and his name would always be written in the Bible. And you know, the interesting thing is the disciples wanted to focus on who sinned that um, he was born blind, but Jesus focused on the fact that now he could see and set him apart to be a witness. And straight away he starts witnessing about how this man Jesus had healed him and had changed his life. Amen? So that's the wonderful thing. Let's not, just, let's not focus on why, why things are not happening. Let's focus on what you've been set apart to do. Yeah, the Bible says that you're anointed by God and set apart. And I just want to um, come to this scripture because it, it can, some people have sort of um, had found this a little bit confusing. Um, but in 1 John 2, just turn to that, the Bible says that the anointing teaches you um, truth and to abide in Christ. And so um, let's just have a look at that. Uh, in 1 John 2, 27, it says, But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it is taught, you will abide in him. You know, some, some people look at that scripture and go, well, if the anointing is teaching me, I don't need to sit under teachers. I don't need to sit you know, under the word of God or the teaching of the word of God. Um, but the truth is that Jesus also appointed in the church teachers and pastors and evangelists. So um, how does that work? Well, I'll tell you how it works. I might be doing the, you know, teaching you right now, but it's really the Holy Spirit that's actually teaching you. It's the Holy Spirit that actually causes the, um, what, I, what I'm saying under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to actually reside with you and resonate with you. And, um, you know, I, I've preached messages and people have come up and said, oh, I really got this out of it, and I don't even remember saying that. And, you know, God knows each of you, and the Holy Spirit is the one teaching you. And for one person, he might be teaching something, and for somebody else, he might be teaching something else, because he knows where we're all at. Amen? And so, yes, there is teaching, but it's the Holy Spirit that's actually teaching you personally. And um, I always say, I'm not the teacher, it's the Holy Spirit. He's just using me. So let's just finish in Psalm 20, 1 to 7. And these are the uh, um, promises of God for his anointed. And so obviously David was one of his anointed, and you are his anointed. And so everything that's true here of David is true of you. 
So let's just have a look at uh, Psalm 20 and 1 to 7. And I'm going to read this out and then I'll go, go back over it. So it says, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice, Selah. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We, we will rejoice in your salvation and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So what, what's it saying here that God, the promises for God's anointed? First of all, it says he will answer you in the day of trouble. Because you are the anointed of God, God will answer you when you're in trouble. And also he will defend you. Then it says he will send you help from the sanctuary. He will actually look after you. When you're in trouble, he will send help for you and strengthen you out of Zion. Then it says he will remember your offerings. And that's, just, that's not just talking about money, but the things that you offer, offering your life, what you do in service for the Lord. He remembers that and honours that. And then it says he will grant you according to your heart's desire. We know other scriptures that talk about that God will give you the desires of your heart. Because you know, when our heart's in the will of God. And he will fulfil all your purpose. Then it also says he will fulfil your petitions. When we talk to God, when we ask God, he says he will fulfil those things. And then it says he saves his anointed. I love that. God is always, he's our saviour. He's always saving us from things, even saving us from ourselves. It says he will answer him from his holy heaven. God says I will answer my anointed. When they speak to him, me, I will answer them. And he, with his saving strength of his right hand. And then we are to trust in the Lord and remember him. Amen. I hope that uh, gets something out of that. Uh, even if you, all you get out of it is that um, God, the, the word of God is, uh, has humour in it. Um, but I'm sure that uh, you'll get a lot out of that. Jesus was anointed by God. You've been anointed. And there are promises there that we can hold on to. God bless you. And uh, pray that you will uh, just this year... Look to the Lord and let your light shine and tell your story and see people wanting to know more about Jesus. Amen.